good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this roundtable on environmental justice. I'm Mayor Lirian Gaylor Baird, and joining me is a good friend and colleague and co-host of this event, Councilwoman Sandra Washington. And Councilmember Washington and I are really pleased to be joined today by key leaders in our community. From the Malone Center, we have Executive Director John Goodwin. And from the Asian Community and Cultural Center, Executive Director Sheila Dorsey Vinton. And representing the Indian Center is Dr. Colette Yellow Robe. And on behalf of El Centro de las Americas is Executive Director Romeo Guerra. And from the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Patient Experience Coordinator Suzanne Miller. From the Good Neighbor Community Center, Executive Director Tom Randa. And I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for being here, lending your leadership and wisdom to the roundtable discussion today. And before we begin, wanted to pause and acknowledge that our community rests on the traditional lands of the Ponca, Omaha, Dakota, and Odo peoples past and present. And we honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through the generations. And this calls us to commit to work in partnership with our indigenous peoples, continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we now inhabit as well. So today's event, represents a collaboration of three city initiatives, the Together One Lincoln, an initiative led by Councilmember Washington, Resilient Lincoln, an initiative led by Mickey Esposito, senior policy advisor in my office, who is also serving today as our facilitator. And finally, the One Lincoln initiative led by Adele Burke, a policy aide in my office. And the purpose and why we've all gathered today is to build awareness and develop a finer understanding cross-culturally of environmental justice in terms of race, class, and identity. And by environmental justice, we mean the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And environmental justice it shines a light on systemic issues that place historically marginalized and low-income communities at an elevated risk of environmental exposure, from air and water and noise pollution to food insecurity, and from flooding and drought to airborne and waterborne illnesses. So we are really grateful to our panelists who will later share their perspectives about environmental issues and conditions that intersect with a concern for social justice and equity. After all, environmental equity is a human right that must be afforded to all our residents. And when I first took office as mayor, my administration launched the Resilient Lincoln Initiative and commissioned the development of a climate action plan meant to assess climate risks and vulnerabilities in Lincoln and to recommend strategies that will increase our community's resilience. We also launched the One Lincoln Initiative and that was designed to ensure that our city is one of opportunity and belonging for all a city where everyone who calls Lincoln home can succeed and fulfill their full human potential. And while the two initiatives may seem independent of one another, they are actually inextricably linked. So as we plan and pursue the Resilient Lincoln and the One Lincoln important work, we need to hold both social and environmental justice in the forefront of our minds if we wanna create a city that is safe and healthy and inclusive, welcoming and fair. Because what we know is to be true is that no matter who you are, where you live, what you care about, climate change poses an existential threat to everyone, all of humankind. And though we all are vulnerable to the impacts of the climate crisis, members of our community who are most exposed are disproportionately affected. And socioeconomic factors such as poverty and race and ethnicity, age, immigration, and food scarcity amplify these climate risks. When we look at our 2019 Lincoln Vital Signs Report, we see that approximately 30% of households in Lincoln live in or near poverty. Seven census tracts in the community are categorized as being in extreme poverty. And the neighborhood with the highest poverty rate of 59% is the North Bottoms, a neighborhood that is also at the highest risk of flooding from Salt Creek. It's also important to acknowledge that we know that poverty rates are not evenly distributed across racial categories. Lincoln's black residents have a poverty rate more than twice as high as whites, followed by Latino and Hispanic residents and Asian residents. 
six of the seven neighborhoods in extreme poverty have a higher percentage of racial and ethnic minorities compared to the rest of Lincoln overall. Moreover, we are proud as a community to be home to many new Americans. A recent survey showed that the top countries of origin are Iraq, Vietnam, Mexico, Burma, and Sudan. We also boast the largest Yazidi population in the US. And the most common languages spoken among new Americans in our community include Spanish, Arabic, Kurdish, Vietnamese, and Korean. Our city's rich multicultural diversity points to the need for translation services as we communicate critical information about climate-related risks to new Americans. And we know that a lack of information in a native language is a vulnerability for those who often need the information the most. And if we respect and bridge the communication gap, we can better serve and protect all our residents. And I would just want to thank all of the leaders on this call who've helped us communicate throughout the pandemic. Another critical need we have in our community to make sure people have access to life saving information. One more statistic I want to share from the Lincoln Vital Signs Report is that 13% of residents in Lancaster County experience food insecurity. And that adds up to about 69,000 of our friends, neighbors, and coworkers. And the COVID-19 crisis has shown how easily food shortages can occur when supply chains are interrupted. Just one look at the long lines of cars and the increased number of patrons at our food banks during this pandemic confirms this. So in a climate-altered future, food insecurity will be exacerbated as global crop yields decline, creating instability in the availability of food. So these challenges I've touched on are just some of the compelling reasons that as we approach this environmental justice work, we must consider the lived experience of our neighbors who may already be carrying incredible and disproportionate weight of multiple burdens. Neighbors who are living in the floodplain or coping with existing health risks or who lack access to adequate services like transportation, quality healthcare or education. Neighbors who are living in a food desert or an area of extreme heat or struggling to put food on the table each night or to pay an expensive utility bill. Neighbors who simply lack important information and resources in their native language. And neighbors who may be carrying the weight of all of these burdens. Because of all of this, I'm convinced that environmental justice is social justice and environmental equity is social equity. They may seem independent at a glance, but they're inextricably linked. And President John F. Kennedy once said that every American is made better off when any one of us is made better off. The rising tide raises all boats. And when we work together to lift those in our community who are most vulnerable and less able to prepare for, or respond to, or to cope with the impacts of a climate altered future, we lift our whole community. And equity is the very core and foundation of environmental justice. And we have the ability and the unprecedented opportunity to meet this moment together. And I'm so glad that we are here together today. At this point, I'd like to invite council member Sandra Washington to speak and to thank her for her leadership in our community. Over to you, council member. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, mayor and good afternoon panelists. I'm honored to be here with you today and to begin this journey, this conversation about environmental justice. Um, like all of you, I believe I am a transplant to Lincoln. Um, I have settled here for a number of years and I put my roots down here and I'm committed to seeing that Lincoln is a community that is welcoming to every new person who chooses Lincoln as their home. As a little girl, I felt blessed to grow up in the countryside close to nature. My parents made the decision to move away from the urban center where they were raised um, and to bring me and my sister and my brother to the country. There I grew up comfortable in the out of doors, surrounded by orchards and fields and small farm operations. So it was really hard news when our land was condemned for a state highway project and we had to sell and move back to town. Not all the way back to the center, but as close to the edge as my parents could get us, close to woods and where the zoning still allowed farm animals. I went on to study natural resources, environmental policy and regional planning. And I worked as a field ecologist and later a community planner uh, and compliance specialist with the National Park Service. And that's just to tell you how my 
growing up close to the, to the out of doors translated into my taking on a career where environmental compliance and environmental justice became part of what I did. Um, most folks think of national parks as places where we recreate and they certainly are places where we recreate and people take vacations, but national parks are also places that are created out of lands um, as the mayor acknowledged that were not um, ours. Um, these are lands that were owned, not owned, were inhabited by indigenous peoples. And so these places which are so special and meaningful to Americans today have had meaning for thousands of years. And it is, uh, it is a responsibility to be a steward of those special places. But I don't believe those national parks are any more special than where we call home. And I believe that all of us, like the mayor has said, deserve environmental justice and equity. In my career, I worked daily with the stew or in the stew of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Analysis, doing macro scale planning and also analyzing um, small projects. In each of those areas, in each of those projects, it was my job to look at how government decisions impacted natural resources, historic sites, as well as socioeconomics. And I had a lot of company with my colleagues when we were discussing impacts on water quality, endangered species, um, cultural landscapes. But I often spoke as a singular voice when I was discussing social impacts on different communities. I worked with good people, but people who were unaware of the different realities and experiences of life if you were poor, an immigrant, or a person of color. Environmental justice embraces the precept that all people and communities are entitled to equal protection. And those civil rights laws that were first signed into being in the mid 60s were not just about employment and housing, but they were about environmental laws and health laws. And in a society which espouses democratic principles, environmental equality is the right, environmental equity is the right thing to do. The conversations about social justice that began last summer spurred me to start Together One Lincoln, a partnership of individuals and organizations committed to strengthening Lincoln by creating dialogue and more importantly, driving action to combat racial inequity. The concept that started me down this path was simple, that very often our ability to learn is stymied by our ability to get past labels. Ask a child if they want to study algebra and mostly you'll get, nope, no way. But ask a child if they want to learn to solve mysteries and you might get an enthusiastic yes. Now, humans are not algebra. We are much more complex and mysterious than that. But the labels of black, Indian, poor, immigrant can stop us from engaging with each other. Together One Lincoln offers tips for how to begin difficult conversations and reminders on how to stay present even when things get uncomfortable in our learning. The conversation today is the start of a dialogue I am committed to see move into action that improves the lives of all Lincoln residents, but mostly, but most importantly, the Lincoln residents who are most vulnerable. Climate change is a reality we need to address, but the starting block for those endeavors is first to listen to your stories and the experiences of the communities you represent. Keeping the car our conversation too far in the future can get in the way of our intention to solve real problems today. And my hope and our intention is to sit at a table sometime soon together and actually put together maps and data and get into the work of addressing these problems today. These problems, solving these problems can make positive changes in people's lives. And I will paraphrase what the mayor said when she quoted President Kennedy. We are all lifted up when each life is improved. And with that, I'll hand the reins back to the mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Washington. Uh, we really appreciate your lifelong passion for environmental protection. 
as well as your inspired leadership on social and environmental justice issues. So thank you. And now I would like to invite our honored guests to share their cultural center mission and priorities. And we will start first with John Goodwin of the Malone Center. Over to you, John. How you doing? I'm John Goodwin, the executive director at the Malone Center. Our vision is simple, is to create unity and prosperity throughout Lincoln and Lancaster County while, offering a, a African, while honoring our African-American heritage. Uh, we are uh, focus is on our youth as well as our community uh, with preschools and out of school programs and maternal wellness and mental health programs and teen programs and COC programs. Uh, so we are all uh, all in the community, all all in our families, uh, engaged in our families and in the community to try to create different experiences for them so we can have better outcomes, more successful outcomes for our families and for our kids. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate you being here today. And next, I'd like to invite Sheila Dorsey Vinton from the Asian Center to tell us more about the mission there. Hi, everybody. Uh, the Asian Community Cultural Center supports and empowers all refugees and immigrants through our programs and services. It advances the sharing of Asian and other cultural heritage of our clients uh, with the community at large. Our vision is that immigrants in Lincoln and the surrounding areas will have access to the resources and support that they need to live better lives. We do that through various programs, including our family resource program, where uh, people can take English classes, citizenship classes, get general help with uh, assistance that they may need in interacting with human service agencies throughout town, um, but have some obstacles because of language barriers. Um, our staff speak over 13 languages in order to assist with those language barriers. We have a youth program that serves over 200 youth in our community, um, including Karen, Yazidi, Sudanese, uh, and other youth that are either refugees or immigrants themselves or children of refugees and immigrants um, who need some guidance in navigating the uh, educational system that may be unfamiliar to them. Uh, we have a senior program where uh, we partner with aging partners and uh, offer the space to Vietnamese seniors when we're not in a pandemic. Uh, and then we also have uh, resources for our other seniors in the community to provide a place to gather and for education and exercise and nutrition classes and taking uh, you know, blood pressure measurements, helping, helping out with whatever things that the seniors need. Uh, a health uh, education and advocacy program where we're getting people to their doctor's appointments. Our staff are trained as community health workers, community breastfeeding educators, uh, peer support specialists for mental health, um, you name it, and, and we want our staff to de develop some expertise in helping the community with those needs. Um, and we have a women's program where we specialize in domestic violence advocacy and connecting with agencies like Voices of Hope and Friendship Home, uh, but providing support and education and empowerment to women. And I think that is all of our programs. And then we uh, part of our mission is sharing cultural heritage of our clients. And so we have the Lunar New Year celebration that's coming up soon and, uh, and the Harvest Moon Festival that's in the fall. And we always try to uh, be a force to advocate for uh, cultural education and awareness in the community as well through um, trainings with new police recruits, for example, uh, working with um physician assistant students at Union College or UNL, uh, UNMC nursing students, and uh, just uh, giving them some different perspectives uh, in how to address uh, multicultural needs. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. Appreciate your leadership in our community as well. And next I'd like to invite Dr. Colette Yellowrobe from the Indian Center to share more about her organization. Yes, of course. Thank you, Mayor. And that was an amazing act to follow. No pressure there. Okay, so I will read it verbatim because I want to be very accurate. So the mission of the Indian Center, which has existed in our community for several decades now, we were one of the first um, urban, Indian, urban Indian centers across the nation. So that's something to always remember. We have a very unique history. 
And our mission is to provide value for our Native American community by creating and obtaining programs that empower self-sufficiency and then positive, excuse me, positive quality of life standards for not only individuals, but also our families. That's a very important aspect of our culture is to preserve the family unit and to honor, especially the role of the woman and the family that would definitely fall in line. Uh, currently, we have an exciting new program that's going to start in combination with St. Monica's, which is the Sacred Woman Project, which will restore um, a facility to help our women and family, the children in our community with substance abuse, co-occurring disorders, and of course, safety and shelter, which is critical. And I wanted to take this opportunity to give a shout out to the rest of the board. We're a working board and we've been working very diligently and I appreciate the leadership by everybody. I would not wanna quantify all the tireless hours everyone has put in, although they could, but it's been a, a commitment to keeping the Indian Center going and as a place of gathering for our community. We have been limited on, um, we've been open and on a limited basis We've had funerals. It's important that our culture, our tribal people have a place to have our funerals and our, our celebration of life for our families. And finally, I will get into this later. We are uniquely positioned in Lincoln next to the Salt Creek. And it's important to give homage to all of the tribes, including mine, mine would travel this far down to gather salt and to do our ceremonies in this area. And I believe, um, some things are not just meant to be. I'm sure that was just a very deliberate planning by our leaders from back in the day who created the Indian Center. Very smart and very wise on their part. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you, Colette. We appreciate you being here today and all you do for our community. And next, I'd like to invite Romeo Guerra to speak. He's here representing El Centro. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and uh, even tougher act to follow by uh, Dr. Uh, Yellow Rope. Um, uh, I am the director for El Centro de las Americas. El Centro de las Americas has been around since 1982. Some people are not aware of that, but it's been here for quite a while. It has evolved and initially it was designed to provide for a place where Hispanics can get together and, and you know, share uh, their culture and, and language and so forth. But it, 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 throughout the years, it grew to provide more direct services and to try and get the Latino community more engaged in civic engagement and in the, the whole operation of the city. Uh, its uh, specific uh, uh, mission is to help Latino families to achieve self-sufficiency, self-determination, and personal growth through the provision of high quality bilingual educational, social, and health services. Basically what that means is we have a lot of services ranging from um, uh, 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 education programs for our youth and the public schools to keep them in school, to keep them engaged in school and to actually think about uh, higher education. Uh, also, we provide a, a variety of health programs ranging from domestic violence support group in Spanish to uh, uh, wellness, uh, wellness checks and, and uh, just a lot of education uh, to uh, our families. Um, lately, our priority has actually been uh, focused on, on trying to uh, help people survive this pandemic. We have been providing a lot of assistance in the area of housing, utilities, and food. And we've also participated quite a bit in campaigns to uh, get people tested and to get them vaccinated. So that's been basically the priority in, and it's, it's, a, it's tough to say, but it's actually been almost a year now. Uh, so uh, we will continue that and definitely uh, we wanna be participating in any environmental justice or social justice campaign that the city has. Thank you. Well, Thank you so much, Romeo. We appreciate all that you do for our community and especially the work uh, during the pandemic as part of the COVID-19 response fund and, and all the rest. Um, next, I'd like to invite Suzanne Miller from the Ponca tribe of Nebraska. Over to you, Suzanne. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna start out with our mission statement here at the Ponca tribe of Nebraska. Um, we, the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, in order to restore all rights previously held by our people and their descendants, promote peace, prosperity, happiness, and the general welfare, welfare of our citizens, of our tribe, and our prosperity. 
to exercise home rule to conserve and perpetuate all worthy traditions and cultural elements of our people long established by customs to improve our social order, to protect our rights as individuals, to promote business enterprise, both cooperative and individual, to promote educational opportunities for all Northern Ponca people, to consolidate our land holding and to provide for the inheritance of both real and personal property. And at the Ponca tribe, we the, the, um, the programs that we have is transportation, domestic violence, health clinics. We have a health clinic in Omaha. We have a health clinic in Norfolk, and soon we will have a health clinic here in Lincoln. Um, we also have youth programs. We have our local community health workers in each community. We have workforce. We do offer behavioral health and substance abuse counseling. We have environmental, environmental protection um, uh, department and also um, we have other locations. We have Norfolk, Niobrara, Lincoln, Sioux City, Carter Lake, and did I say Omaha? Lincoln. So that's that's the spiel for the Ponca tribe. Thank you, Suzanne, mm -hmm. for all you do. And um, last but not least is Tom Randa from the Good Neighbor Community Center and also serves on our Board of Health. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, uh, the Good Neighbor Community Center was started in 1973, and uh, that's when the Lincoln Seventh-day Adventist churches came together. Uh, so over the years, uh, they've worked uh, on various things, but uh, back in the day, um, disaster response was one of the main things they used to do and uh, basic and emergency needs. Uh, so the church kind of led this uh, uh, organization for a while. And then in 2004, we became uh, incorporated. So uh, for now, the church still owns the building, uh, but now we have our own uh, board that kind of runs the uh, things. Um, when I joined in 2007, our mission was helping people help themselves. And we just changed that last year, right before we, uh, we took a break in March because of the, of the pandemic uh, to uh, welcoming uh, neighbors and supporting stability. So that's our new uh, mission statement. When I say we took a, a break, it was about a week's break when the pandemic hit mid-March, just to figure out how we were going to continue providing services. We knew people needed food, so we found a way of continuing doing that through the drive through system. And we've done food distribution for so many years. So for six out of seven days, you'll come to the Good Neighbor Center and you should be able to get uh, either a pantry, uh, uh, perishable food, um, or you can just come and do one of the food nets. So uh, various opportunities uh, during the week to be able to get uh, food from us. Uh, the other programs that we do are the basic and emergency needs. We do have a shopping floor, which we had to close because of COVID. Uh, most of our volunteers are older, so we decided we better keep them safe. We told them to stay at home and that uh, we are looking forward to everybody being vaccinated and joining us again. Uh, so for now, until uh, all that is done, uh, we are waiting, we have everything on hold. And it's been about five staff members um, helping with the drive-through. And we have one volunteer, which is interesting because um, He's a client that used to come and get food from us. So when the pandemic hit, he saw that we were struggling to give out food and control traffic at the same time. So he volunteered to control traffic for us. And he has done that when it's raining, you know, when it's sunny, uh, throughout the season. So uh, he's our uh, only volunteer that has been coming and we've been very appreciative of him. And he doesn't even get food anymore, so which is very surprising because we would have thought that, you know, he would be needing that food some more. Anyway, so uh, food is one of the main programs that we have here. Our basic needs, you know, people, when we open up, people can come for clothing, household items. Uh, we give out diapers. Um, and then we also provide uh, transportation assistance. Uh, we have people who need to go to school, uh, people who need to get to medical appointments. If they can't afford it, they can come to us and we'll provide them with a bus pass uh, to be able to use our buses. Uh, we also have uh, a program called Middle East North Africa Hope Project, which is part of the reason why we are part of this group with the cultural centers. Uh, with, with that group, uh, we do various things. Um, Think of the immigrants that are coming in uh, to Lincoln and they need to resettle. 
We work with them from the time they come, uh, uh, finding homes, uh, getting to schools, uh, helping them get housing. Uh, and then we start working on their English. So we have English classes, we have computer classes. So those are some of the things that uh, we give them are uh, tools so that they can be able to be uh, successful uh, as, as they continue to resettle here in Lincoln. We also take part in uh, rent and uh, utility assistance so that those who are being evicted uh, can be able to stay in their homes or those who are homeless, we can be able to try uh, to help them uh, get back into their homes. So in a nutshell, that's what we do at the Good Neighbor Community Center. Thank you so much, Tom, for what you do um, to help address basic needs in our community to make it a more welcoming city. I, I know as we hear all of the incredible services that our panelists provide, we feel proud, um, uh, both the council member, I'm sure, and myself, we both feel proud to serve alongside you in Lincoln. So thank you. And with, with that, we thought next we would turn to you for questions. Um, we will take turns, Councilmember and I, asking each of you questions. Are you ready to start, Councilman Washington? All right. I am. Okay. With great. my finger on the mute, unmute button, I'm ready. You are. Well, great. I'd like to start by kicking it off with Suzanne. Suzanne, I would like to ask you to speak a little bit about what resilience means to you. Um, that we have thrived and we have stood resilient in the face of continued atrocities. Um, our people are still here. Um, our ancestors taught us that we are not protesters, that we are protectors. Um, we as Native people believe that everything comes full circle and that the circle symbol has always been important to our Native people because it represents the sun, the moon, the cycles of the season. Cycles of life to death to rebirth. The four directions, north, south, east, and west. And then the elements of air, water, fire, and earth. And that we continue to continue through resilience as a strong foundation passed down from our generation to generation. That's what I feel resilience means to me. Thank you. Council member? Romy, how has environmental, how have environmental risk affected the communities that you serve and their livelihoods? Um, thank you. The, the environmental risk factors impact the Hispanic Latino community in many, many ways. It impacts it highly. And I, I'm going to pick just a few areas because it can get very broad. But um, obviously, it impacts everybody's livelihood if you don't have a good job or if your environment in, the, in your workplace is not very sanitary or has a lot of uh, environmental hazards. And as you all know, uh, Latinos uh, work in a lot of industries where there's a high risk of safety and environmental uh, uh, issues in construction and meatpacking plants and just uh, in service areas where the, the exposure to those kinds of things are, are very uh, 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 prevalent. The other area that I want to talk about a little bit is the housing arrangements. Uh, the Latinos live in a lot of apartments and a lot of low income housing. Um, and so consequently, the, the exposure to uh, lead and radon and mercury and uh, uh, asbestos, pesticides, all those things uh, are very prevalent in those uh, older homes and so forth. And so that really impacts the children. And it has long-term effect on children because it, 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 it affects their neurological, their IQ, a lot of their learning abilities and so forth. So it has some very long range uh, impact. And so those are the two areas that I think uh, really have impacted negatively to the Latino community, their housing arrangement and their work environment. Uh, you raise a, some really good points there. Mayor. Thank you. Um, next question is for Sheila. And Sheila, I was hoping you could speak to what you feel is our greatest challenge for achieving food security for everyone in Lincoln. Certainly. Um, so first of all, food security involves uh, availability of food, food access, and that includes access to preferred foods, not just any food that is happens to be available. Um, food utilization and stability of your the food um, that is available, right? And as you'd mentioned before, Mayor, uh, in Lincoln, we have about 13% 
fo folks who are food insecure, and that translates to 69,000 people. Um, when I think about food security and, and of course the pandemic, uh, I only have to look at the data from the Asian Center to know that so many more people are food insecure. Because I can look at, in 2019, we did 303 services for food, um, helping with food. And in 2020, it was 1,037. So we more than tripled the amount of uh, food aid and just helping people and getting access to food. Uh, we can look around town and know that uh, people are putting up the little uh, free food pantries and they're being utilized at a high rate. Um, we also know that some of the, the things that we've put in place that are um, markers of, of meeting um, the challenges of having food deserts in Lincoln, for example, where we had the, the mobile truck to serve vegetables, was actually shut down during the pandemic because of, um, you know, we, just fears of, of spreading the virus. I think that we know a little bit more now than we did then uh, at the beginning of the pandemic about how to do things safely. Um, so some of these things that that uh, we had started to put in place, I think we can start to put back into place because there is a significant need. And, and with the clients that we serve, um, uh, access to foods that are um, culturally relevant uh, is important. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever gone to a grocery store in another country, but if you have, and there are fruits and vegetables there that you don't know what they are uh, and you don't know how to prepare them. You don't know, you don't know what will make them nutritionally sound. Uh, that is a barrier. So having food available doesn't necessarily mean that it is accessible because you have to have knowledge about how to use it too. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, Sheila. Um, over to you, council member. All right, the next question is for John. Um, what advice do you have for the city regarding its efforts to create equity, environmental equity and justice in Lincoln? Well, a couple of, a couple of things that I see, um, maybe that I can offer that, that will be able to help is to, is to meet the people where they are. And what I mean by that is physically, mentally, uh, emotionally meet the people where they are. How do, how do I do that? Well, when I meet them is it, bringing awareness, raising awareness, uh, extending an invitation to build an inclusive community. Um, the community has to know that they trust. In order to do that, you have to build a relationship and you have to stand firm on what you say and, and, and what you say you're gonna do. It's one thing, a lot of times when the community is not talking, it's because they feel that there's, they feel that there's nothing that's gonna be done. They feel that they're, why should I say anything? Because all we do is talk, but there's action behind the talk. And if the city can be assuring, just for instance, just meeting with the people and, and, and talking over assuring public health and safety from drinking, drinking uh, uh, safe drinking water to, uh, a healthy air and quality, you know, in, in conditions. Um, having these conversations, sharing each other's stories, uh, building a rapport and a relationship. And once we leave that conversation, act on what we talked about. And when we act on what we talk about, bring it back to the community and say, this is what I found, this is what I've done. Let's continue to move forward and be inclusive. I use the, the analogy of, of Walmart and how you can be wealthy, you can be middle class, you can, you can be whatever race you may be, but Walmart is gonna accept you and take your money. Why, they are the most inclusive store. Everybody can shop at Walmart, but everyone can't shop at a Neiman Marcus. Everyone can't shop at a Von Mar. So if the, if the city can be more inclusive in making themselves available, being intentional, intentional about uh, making themselves available to the community and not just hearing, but being a doer from what they heard, 
that will bring some closeness and, and, that, and, and a relationship with the city and the community to move forward in justice and equality. You're right. Um, we should be as open as possible. And sometimes I think um, our jargon gets in the way. And uh, just saying, reminding us that is a, a good point. Thank you. Mayor. All right, this next question is for you, Tom, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can create economic prosperity and environmental protection and a quality of life for everyone in our community. Uh, such a broad question, especially when you say everyone. <laughs> um, but I can definitely speak uh, from my experience and maybe from the experience of the people that we serve. Um, from my experience, I'll go back to 2001 when I came here to Lincoln as an immigrant. But if you go further back, um, here's this young boy in Kenya uh, wanting an American dream, you know? Uh, but while we're in Kenya and most, most of the immigrants, when we look at the United States, uh, we never think of Lincoln. Uh, we never think of Nebraska. You know, with what we see on TV is all these movies being acted in all these big you know, places, big buildings. Uh, so that's where I was. And actually, when I came to the U.S., ended up in Washington State. I didn't know I was going to end up in Lincoln. But I ended up here. Um, but when I came here, what I like is that there was that opportunity. There was an opportunity for me uh, to grow. Uh, I needed the support um, and guidance. Uh, of course, through that as well, there's money involved to be able to get through college so I can get that education so that I can get out of poverty and help my family back in Kenya also get out of poverty. And uh, during that time, there were several risks that I had to go through uh, that are kind of tied to this. Uh, when you're thinking about going through college, you need a job, you can't get any federal funds. So you gotta have a job. And I ended up working McDonald's. Maybe most of you do not know that, but I worked my way through college. I worked McDonald's. That's how I paid my, uh, my tuition. Uh, in the summer, I would work you know, 40 hours uh, off campus and then 40 hours on, um, on campus. So about 80 hours uh, during the week to be able to get enough money so that they can allow me uh, to come back uh, the next semester. So during that time, uh, there was these extreme uh, summers in Lincoln. Uh, you know, most people think that, you know, Africa is hot. Uh, it is not as hot as Lincoln in, in the summer. This place can get really hot. And then the other extreme is the coldness. It gets super cold. Um, I did not have transportation, so I had a bike. I knew how to ride a bike. So I would come from Union College, go all the way to Van Don on a bike, but when it snowed, that complicated things. And think about when I had to go maybe to Super Saver uh, because I could not wait for the bus system or, uh, you know, it's just complicated. Uh, so that would take hours just to go to Super Saver and get something to eat and come back to the dorms. So if you think about those things that do end up affecting uh, how, uh, everyone and, and the economy and getting it better, those are some of the things. Now let's fast forward, I'm done with college and I have a job. What are some of the things that uh, we are thinking about? Uh, when you talk about economic uh, prosperity, it's not just about the money. It's also about uh, being innovative. Uh, our people in Lincoln need to have that opportunity to be uh, innovative. They need to be able to uh, create uh, new products and uh, new services and uh, better ways of doing things. And these are opportunities that as a director here at the Good Neighbor Center, I'm able to have those because uh, uh, having a good eco uh, economy is not just about the money, but uh, those things that I'm talking about. And what about the people that we serve? What's, what's their perspective? Uh, before they can get to talking about the economy and the environment, um, they are looking about uh, at uh, health. What's the quality of their health? Uh, are they strong enough to be able to look for jobs? Uh, do they have food security, which Sheila was talking about? And if, as we talk about food, uh, we are talking about other factors that do affect food itself. You know, things like water. We are talking about air. You know, and the qualities of all, of those things. Yes, you can have water, but what's the quality uh, of that water? What's the quality of that of the so of the soil? And uh, uh, as we move along, uh, how about shelter? Now that I want to work uh, at a job, at the end of the day, I'm, where am I going to sleep? Um, 
how about utilities? Am I going to be able to be warm in this house that I'm living with? in in uh what about when we have all these shadow notices that we can't pay our bills are we going to be able to pay them and uh, we're talking about clothing uh clothing as well uh to be able to to go to work and education also uh for the people that we serve so it's gonna take a lot of um education for the people we serve and most of the people in lincoln to get our economy going and also uh the environment direction to change that and get it better uh we were talking about what kind of paints are we going to, to use in our, in our homes? Uh, how are we going to conserve energy? And how are we going to uh, use less pollutants in, on, on the things that uh, uh, we are having? So those are some of the things that I think of that are going to uh, get everybody uh, better as far as uh, economic uh, prosperity, environment, and the quality of life is involved in Lincoln. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm picturing you on your bike in the snow. <laughs> uh, it's quite quite a remarkable story that you've shared and um, what you're saying about transportation and not just jobs, but opportunities to innovate um, along with the basics of making sure people have their basic needs met so they can step out into a better future it really resonates. Thank you. Uh, over to you, council member. All right, the next question is for uh, Colette Gallarro. Uh, Collect. How has, I want your perspective um, on how do you think our country's history with exploitation and domination of the land shaped environmental justice today? Yes, of course. Thank you, Council Member Washington. And I appreciate you giving your background and the phenomenal work that you did, especially as that singular voice. And so I want to build upon what everyone else has talked about. But just for a second, I want to go back to the fact that our mayor gave a land acknowledgement. That is the first at a major event in our city. And I appreciate her, Naish and Cheyenne, Pinagigi, where I grew up. And thank you so much for that. Now, I know some of you, I see Suzanne's on here. Good to see you. I'm seeing Trevor and Romeo. I know a little bit about your background, my dear fraternity brother, John, as well. And I get, I'm getting to know, of course, Mr. Randa's story. But I want us to all go back and think about where we grew up. I got to grow up in Winnebago. So I was not a member of the tribe of which I grew up. They were relocated in Nebraska. And I want you to think about your hometown that you grew up on or wherever your fond memory is coming from. I like to take the land acknowledgements a step further with all due respect to our amazing marriage for the purposes of leading into our history of domination. Sometimes we're growing up in a beautiful area that we're not even realizing until later, even where I grew up in Winnebago, you know, understanding the relocation of what they went through as a, a magnificent people, what my tribe went through. We were once indigenous out west in Nebraska, and we, we definitely went through struggle to get the reservation we are on now today in Montana as a way to connect people to the land, because we do look upon it as um, as stewards, in some cases, it's sacred. There are sacred landmarks in Nebraska that um, are still being used in ceremonies today. And then to also give history of how the land was looked upon as being conquered. So in Nebraska, you would use a settlerism framework or the frontier or the pioneering model was really the, the brand of colonization and racism that was going on here. And of course, looking at Lincoln, we'd have to think about the history before this, the territory became a state where we have uh, account, accounts of slavery, persons who were enslaved of African descent. And then we have the brutal removal of tribal histories and then the influx of migrant labor into the areas. I bring that up to give us the framework that this is not a problem of yesteryear similar groups or descendants of the same peoples and groups are experiencing the same things. And I believe my colleagues on the call have beautifully already brought out how contemporary problems are mirroring the past. I want to leave us though with, I guess, a, a specific call to action that that history is it to make all of us feel bad. And I hope you felt good thinking about where you grew up. You know, it's a fond memory. And then Lincoln's been good to me. Certainly I've made quite the career here. I appreciate that 24 hour Walmart, John, I have to tell you that right now, growing up on the res was not the case for that. So I like 24 hours, okay. But 
you know, with all, with all jokes aside and all seriousness, this is a chance for all of us to come together in solidarity and really think about how it is going to take all of us. And none of us have been exempted from the environmental horrors or just the after the social effects as well. That's just a preview. That's people do whole dissertations on that. So I'm not I'm not gonna go all nerd out on that, okay, council member, if you're okay with that. Uh, you you raise well, you raise a very good point about um, how much each of us have a story that uh, mirrors parts of history um, and that we are more connected and more similar than we are dissimilar. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Um, this next question is for you, Sheila, and I was hoping you could speak a little bit about how our history of racial exclusion has shaped some of the environmental risks and realities that we see today. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to speak on that uh, because there is certainly a historical context to environmental justice and um, our current reality of, of injustice or <clears throat> uh, environmental justice, racial injustice, um, equities or inequities are a direct result of historical processes. So um, thank you Colette for uh, talking about colonialism and the occupation of land. Uh, that it certainly begins there. And uh, Jim Crow laws, redlining, uh, all of those highlight power differentials that people experienced. Um, and some can argue that uh, that uh, redlining may not even be over, even though it officially might be illegal or, or over, it is unofficially not. Uh, there is still a differential in investment in certain areas of town uh, versus other areas of town. We can acknowledge that. Um, and so what is redlining? We'll, we'll use redlining as an example there. So since the 1930s, even in Lincoln, uh, there was systematic racial and, um, well, mostly racial segregation uh, that, uh, and it was dictated by uh, real estate investment, uh, banking decisions about who could live in certain areas of town and who couldn't. And uh, uh, Lori Seibel, who's on the call, gave a great presentation about this. And you can, you can see this in the MAPS project uh, that CHE has done, where we can look at where those census tracts are. And we know that they exactly correlate to districts since the 1930s that were redlined. Um, and so, um, you know, understanding that that current realities have a historical basis um, is something that we we need to consider and also uh, rectify. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I think the the way you talk about both an awareness of historical realities coupled with data that shows us today's realities is a really important kind of framework for approaching this work. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. Over to you, council member. And thank you for mentioning um, the Community Health Endowment and the work of Lori Seibel in uh, um, Place Matters. I think that is one of the most interesting programs uh, we have for collecting data and showing real life examples of how life is different based on your geography. and. When we get to sit at that table together, I really want to sit there with the floodplain, the poverty, the minority uh, maps, as well as current zoning allowances for industrial and highway. Um, I, I just want to see all those things layered together and talk about that reality. The next question I have, though, uh, is for Romeo Guerra. Um, Romeo. How do we build trust? How do you think we build trust with people who may feel historically disenfranchised and marginalized in our community? Well, that's a real tough one. Yes. Um, as you just heard, based on history, uh, it is very tough to then to say, okay, now trust us. You know, we've trusted that establishment in the past before and it wasn't very helpful. 
So now when uh, communities are, you know, they, they reach out to the communities and say, trust us, we're trying to help the situation, it's very difficult to build that trust. Uh, but I will add a little bit to what Brother John said about, you know, we, we have to follow through with what we say. For example, uh, just basically it comes down to less rhetoric and more action. We hear a lot of things. We talk a lot about poor people. We talk a lot about disenfranchised people, but we rarely talk to them. We talk about them quite a bit and plan for them quite a bit, but we don't get a lot of input. So we have to develop some very good outreach that actually gets to the community. Perhaps things like uh, town hall meetings uh, that are in the language or at least culturally appropriate to that community so that we can get input. On the other hand, we have to be able to accept correction. In other words, what I mean by that is, as policymakers, we do solicit input many times, and we try to get input. But if it doesn't, but if the information doesn't quite fit the plan, we just ignore it, or you know, go over it some other way and justify that that uh, correction is is not that relevant. Um, something else that we need to do is to uh, design some identifiable community investments. And what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, after we all these plans are drawn up, we know the issues, we know the problems, and we sometimes even have some of the solutions, but we fail to implement them if it's going to mean that we're going to have to invest in specific communities instead of the overall general community. I, I think sometimes we tend to put a lot of money into the general community, hoping that it's gonna help the, uh, the those that are disenfranchised and so forth, but it doesn't reach to that level. So I think those are some of the things that would be helpful. Um, I, and, and, and beyond that, I think there needs to be some real needs assessments, specific needs assessments in terms of what the actual problems are per specific population group, instead of doing some general needs assessment of the, of the city of Lincoln. Those are just some thoughts that come to mind uh, right off the top of my head. Thank you, thank you. Ma'am. Uh, this next question is for you, Colette, and I was hoping you could speak to what you envision transformative environmental justice. What, what does that look like to you? Yes, of course, absolutely, Mayor. So again, I'm in my history moment today. I'm just rolling with history, but I wanted to take us back to um, historical, historically, especially in our area, Midwest, in the United States, we tended to go this way. We would rally around environmental issues that affected our parks that were alluded to already or our forests or green spaces. And that's great. That was great movement. And that's wonderful. However, in light of several factors in this past decade, if not two decades, probably going back to Al Gore, now that we've had the internet affect us, we have a global community. Our worlds have grown expansively so much via virtual access. And most certainly in light of the, the three global crises that we are in right now, we have to be mindful of how other areas across the globe have advocated and championed environmental causes. So I suggest that we look at not just our local factors, as Mr. Guetta so eloquently pointed out and everyone else, but also how are we falling into global environmental concerns? So that would be my approach to it. What does that mean? That means that we have to make concrete connections and look for very serious resolutions to problems that are not just, they are unique to Lincoln, for example, or Nebraska, but not necessarily just us, meaning we will move out of the American exceptionalism mentality that tends to keep us siloed and not looking for innovative solutions or giving homage or honor to many groups that have been doing things or, and not taking a pioneering again approach to things. And I hesitate to give a very simple definition to that because in order to truly understand something, it is about your own discovery. So getting to know where you stand on issues and not making it unavailable and avoiding elitism. I think that affects environmental causes. It becomes very elite and abstract when it could just be a matter of, are we addressing the way industrialization has affected the the architecture and planning of our buildings that are now 
in need of overhauls, for example. And I'm going to give a shout out to our school system. I think this is a chance to really embed our students, the young ones who I believe in our future for opportunities. This is what they're going to inherit. And are we okay with what we're living that, leaving them? If you want architects, you have to make the pipeline for them. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I I uh, appreciate your historical perspective and how that comes to bear on thinking, not just locally, but also globally. And one of the aspects of this pandemic that I think resonates with what you said is that we have this ability to create new connections. We're all experiencing something in real time, no matter where we live in this, on this earth. And while none of us would ever have wished for it, we have this lived experience right now um, that is shared. And um, we are all discovering sort of our strengths and weaknesses in new ways. And it's my deepest hope that the lessons of the pandemic include ways that we can move forward and be transformed as individuals and help transform society as we look at environmental justice concerns. Because again, that threat is just like the coronavirus, something that is a it's we're all facing together no matter where we live. Thank you for that insight. Um, council member. A number of you have already spoken about your communities and um, being specific about ways to build trust and engagement. And this next question I'm gonna direct to Tom. Um, Tom, what are the ways your community members would like to be or take part in addressing environmental justice issues in their neighborhoods? Uh, that, that, is a, that is a good question because um, what I've come to learn is um, sometimes you might have to um, spend uh, something to be able to save something. And uh, uh, a good approach for this is an example. Uh, I'm glad Laurie is here because we're all going to use her as an example today. I don't know if she left, but uh, the Good Neighbor Community Center, we had an issue a few years ago where our uh, uh, ACs were going down and uh, with all the food that we have, you know, it was uh, going to spoil. So, you know, I reached out to her and I said, this is the issue we are having. What are we going to do? And um, Back, you know, if you if you go back a little bit is uh, they had helped us get an energy audit for our center. It's an old building, but we were able to do an energy audit. And so over the years, we've been looking at that audit and then seeing what is it that we need to do to fix um, those things. Uh, I started with things like windows, uh, changing our windows, our doors. And then when it came to this problem where we have uh, ACs, ACs that are too old and need to be replaced, uh, you know, we are used to saying, let's look uh, uh, for the cheapest bid so that uh, we can use that uh, to replace what is going down. Uh, so that's a concept that uh, Laurie introduced uh, me to. And uh, as, a, as a director, I'm, I'm used to being told you, you go look for beads and the cheapest one is the one we are going to find. But here is a person saying, let's look for one that's more energy efficient so that in the long run, as an organization, you're saving money. And that's what we ended up doing. We got some uh, very nice um, uh, ACs and furnaces, uh, thumb, uh, controllable, uh, uh, pro programmable thermostats. And uh, over the years, uh, we saw our bills starting to go down uh, we were spending close to 13000 a year on energy, and now it's about 9000 So you can see that uh, such things, uh, small things, uh, help a lot. So we spend some money uh, to be able to uh, save some money. So with the, with the clients that we work with, we also try to tell them, uh, you know, do some recycling uh, so that we can uh, uh, protect our environment. Uh, you can buy a water filter instead of, you know, buying all these bottles of water uh, and that might be able to save our environment. How about reducing the waste that you have? You know, uh, you, you write notes and, you know, you throw all these papers all the time. Uh, you can do better. There are some things you can do better. How about um, buying a, a shower head that's going to save you money so you're not 
uh, wasting too much money and you'll see that bill uh, uh, go down and shopping wisely, uh, weatherization for uh, your, your place, which is kind of hard because most of them rent. And that one, they're always like, well, I have to talk to the landlord. And, you know, if the landlord is not big on fixing their uh, or their homes, then they can't do that. Um, and when the days were nice, uh, we used to encourage them to carpool uh, so that they can save uh, <laughs> on, on that. Uh, things like that, planting trees and um, uh Using less energy, like things like bulbs, you know, the kind of bulb you're using in your in your in your house makes uh, makes a, a difference. So those are some of the things that uh, we talk to our clients uh, that we work with that can help them uh, protect our environment and be able to uh, keep everybody safe in our environment. Thank you so much. You took the concept of sustainability and put it into real life actions that we can all take. And I think sometimes we talk about sustainability as a, a jargonish kind of word when it, in fact, it's just, what can we sustain over our lifetimes? What actions can we do to sus be sustainable for the environment, for the economy, for our own homes and families? And that, those are some wonderful ideas, Tom. Thank you for making that real. Mayor. Yeah. Tom, if you can help me teach my kids to turn off the lights, I'll be so happy. That's my next assignment for you. <laughs> um, thank you. And this next question is for Suzanne. And Suzanne, I would love to hear from you on what it means to live in a safe and strong and vibrant and resilient community. Um, taking the initiative to educate yourself on all cultures, beliefs, and have an open mind with no judgments. Um, coming together and creating the group connection and building a relationship with one another, um, helping one another and to unite as one. Also having a backup plan for our community ahead of time um, for catastrophic events um, that could possibly come our way, um, such as solar power, um, creating food sovereignty that would give us um, the, our minds would be at ease if we could create that food sovereignty and just in case, you know, we don't have that food supply coming in, having that as our community um, food. Um, just for me, just coming together, um, education, educating one another, um, being kind um, to one another. I think that would definitely um, make me feel I live in a safe, strong, vibrant and resilient community doing this work together is so important for it to have a wider impact. Thank you. Back to you, council member. All right, John, this question is for you. I think this conversation and everything leading up to it today shows how clearly the city wants to engage our citizens in the intent, with an intention of preserving our environment and creating environmental justice for all. A lot of people wonder, what can I do? How can I start? And so I'm gonna give you that question. How do we meet people where they are? That's a good question. And I will try to answer it in a way that I won't uh, take long. We are, I was always taught and I've learned that we are who we are based on our experience in life. Uh, I am who I am based on the experience. Either if I, I've read about something, I, I've been through something, I've seen something. So I am, I'm the man who I am right now based on those experiences. You are who you are based on those experiences. I believe even, I've, I've strongly believed that success is different for everyone. And based on your experience, dictates how you think, how you behave, and the outcomes that you have. That happens anyway. That happens anyway with anyone. If you're dealing with success or just going through life and just trying to figure it out, that those steps happen anyway. And those outcomes are going to happen. Um, the city has provided a map on where uh, those areas are of poverty. Uh, someone, I think the mayor mentioned uh, the bottoms and there's other areas here in, around the Malone Center, there's areas there. So you ask, what can we do? I think what we can do is show up, show up in those areas, but not just show up, but to show up to offer a different experience that 
everyone should have an opportunity to be successful. Some don't know how to be successful. You can move someone from the bottoms to the south side, but they still may have that poverty mentality. So it starts with the mind. What we're looking at is what we see on the map is manifestations of how a person may think or how a group of, of the area of, of where there's no one, it's nothing to look at for prosperity or for help. I'm gonna take an example. I was listening to a NASCAR driver and he was driving the car and what NASCAR told him was, one thing I need you to remember is don't focus on the wall because if you focus on the wall, you're gonna hit the wall. And what's happening is that we have these areas in the city because there's nothing for the people in that area to focus on, to be successful, to get out of that mindset. How can we just cannot just show up to an event and listen to people, go back and try to put something together. If we have the map, now it's time to, now we know what the area is, now it's time to come up with a game plan. It's time to come up with a strategy to where that we are providing to that community a way out. So in other words, there should be a place for the city to, to provide a place right in the middle of that area that someone can look at that would change their experience and would change their mindset to be able to move forward and prosper the way that them and their family should prosper. We shouldn't just come and just listen and talk and say, hey, I've been there. Yes, I've been at this meeting. I get it. We move on. But, but, but the real work, the real work is, is providing a game plan. I'm a coach, so I'm always looking to game plan on how to beat the opponent. Well, what is, what is our opponent? Our opponent is poverty. How, how poverty, how do we get out of poverty? How do we get out of that mindset? What are some of the things that we can do? What are the resources that we can bring into this area to where we're able now to change the experience of the people in that area to where they're now starting to think differently? You're going to behave on the way you think. So now you're starting to behave on that thinking of your experience that was changed that will bring a more successful outcome to that community. So put us, the, 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 the creative mindset, the, 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 the prosperous mindset, the, the ability to create and to move things around in a place to, where, where people can actually see you can, can come to a, a Malone Center or an Asian Center or all the centers that we have here to, to gain resources and knowledge on how to, I, how can I change the way now? Yes, I was always raised this way, but that, that's the experience that I've always had. So that's all I know. So if I know that I, I struggle paycheck to paycheck or I can't afford my lights because my mom couldn't or my dad couldn't or they were never around. That's all I know. That was my experience. So yes, that's your experience. But let me provide a different experience for you to be able to get out of that mindset to change how you are and who you are right now. So when your kids come along, they won't have to deal with what I've been dealing with this whole time. And so if the city can provide, you say, how can we, how can we meet them? We meet them, we go to them, we go into those areas and we have a game plan because we have the map. We saw the map, we saw the area. Now we just need a game plan to be able to change the experiences of the people, which is their mind. Because if we can change the conception of what they have of themselves, <laughs> we, we will be able to bring and maybe uplift that poverty. It, 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 it may rise up over here. Okay, the area, now we lifted this area up. Let's go over to this area. Let's see how we can build this area up. But you have to be, again, committed. You have to be, again, intentional. And you have to be, you have to say, no, I am not going to leave here until this, this area has become better than it once was. And we do that by bringing that game plan, that strategy, that, that, that commitment 
to the to the area to build that area up. And if they're not, if you're not committed to that, then there's always going to be poverty. There's always going to be some people need help. It's not like, well, if they need it, they can come to us. No, no, because based on their experience, they have always been this way. So we have to now go to them and pull them out and say, hey, there is something better. What is it? Well, let me tell you what it is. And it may be mental health. It may be a physical health. It may be learning how to do an interview. It may be learning how to pay bills, learning how to budget. It's an economic problem. People think that, oh, the, the uh, so much crime over here, so much crime, oh, they just won't. Well, if we build an economic, if, they, if we teach them economics, you may, you may have less crime of people breaking in people's houses and because now they learned a skill and it's about teaching people a skill to be able to operate in their gift, to be able to bring them out of this current situation. Because if we don't, con if we don't change the conception of the people, they're going to believe what they conceive and they're going to receive what they believe. So we have to start with the mind and being, and being able to offer a different experience for them. And that comes through programming. That's, that comes through being intentional about what we're trying to do and how we're trying to help the people. So how do we meet the people where they are? We go to them, but we go to them with our hands loaded with a bunch of information on how we can give them and offer a different experience for their families and for the community to build them up and to get them to where they need to go in being prosperous. That's my answer. So I hope I hope Amen. I answered that question. Yeah. Um, it feels, John, it's like you, you told, you reminded us um, that we're teaching people to fish that we are going beyond walk, uh, talking, that we're gonna have to actually walk the walk. It's not just about talking. And, and you basically told us to show up and be present and to commit ourselves again and again and again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That commitment and intention are, are everything. And when you said, we're not gonna leave until we've left it better than we found it, that's what this is about for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I really want to appreciate all of you for sharing your experience, your wisdom, your advice, and your guidance as we approach this work. Um, we are definitely better off when we are having these kinds of intentional conversations, working together and putting those intentions into action with a sense of solidarity that one of you mentioned toward a a more equitable and resilient and shared future. Thank you. Thank you again to all of you, our roundtable panelists. Um, your participation is vital in this work. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts in this discussion on environmental justice and your views and perspectives will be guiding our actions. Um, your insight and advice is really valuable to achieving environmental equity in a meaningful way in Lincoln and um, Beyond that, I really wanna just say how important the work is that you do at your centers, your cultural centers, our service agencies, our cultural centers, our nonprofit organizations. Everyone on this call today has a meaningful role to play. And we are really fortunate and grateful that each of you is leading, each of you is contributing, each of you is committed and providing selfless service to the people of Lincoln. And um, of course, thank you to Councilmember Washington for your leadership and inspiring really, really crucial conversations through the Together One Lincoln Initiative and for welcoming our guests and co-hosting with me today. Um, like John said, let's make sure we continue this work with intention, with commitment as we work together uh, to increase our social capital, to strengthen and enrich our community, to protect our residents and help them see what a different experience of life can be like and to preserve our quality of life and improve it for everyone going forward. Thank you so much for being a part of this a special event today and I'll see you soon.